Hello, my name is Tessa, if you haven't met me before. I'm today going to talk a little bit about why I think the role of the body in birth is ignored. And I'm interested in that because um, I have a degree in social anthropology, a PhD in medical sociology, and I've always been interested in why people behave the way they do, the way that they think about themselves, and particularly how people think about the body, their own body, the body in general, um, and how that's changed over time. So taking historical con um, perspective and, and seeing, you know, what influences have there been that have changed our views over time. And I'm particularly interested in the body in birth because I'm a pregnancy yoga teacher. So I'm a senior trainer for the Yoga Teacher Forum um, for prenatal and postnatal yoga. And I'm a volunteer for the Maternity Voices Partnership at the hospital. So my local hospital is the Royal Berkshire Hospital, RBH. Um, and if you've never heard of the Maternity Voices Partnership before, it's a national thing. So wherever you are in the UK, there should be a group near you. Um, and their aim really is to collect feedback from um, people who are going through the NHS um, and to understand their antenatal experience, uh, how labour and birth was, how their care was, um, and postnatally as well. So sometimes it's through a survey that you can do online or some groups going to the community. So in normal times, that would be going to a baby group and collecting feedback, whether it's negative or positive. And I really feel that my local maternity voice partnership um, they really do make changes as a result of feedback. So I'd really encourage you to, to seek out um, your, your local MVP <laughs> if you've got something to say. I also am a mum. <laughs> so most importantly, um, I have two daughters. One was born at the hospital and the other one was born at home. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of the body and how we see the body, because I think that's really important in understanding where we've got today. Because nothing sort of exists in a vacuum. We're surrounded by, you know, what's happened in the, in the past. And then I'll go on to very practical things about what you can do to support your body during pregnancy, labour and birth. So it often seems to me that the body is seen as an inconvenience um, or sometimes, you know, something that's going to go wrong. There's a risk of it going wrong and breaking down. And it's a bit strange because when we think of pregnancy, generally it's um, a very exciting time. And, you know, it seems amazing that you can grow new life inside your own body. And it's, you know, people might even call it a miracle and it's something to be celebrated. And then a lot of the time that goes out the window when it comes to labour, suddenly this amazing body that has been growing this baby most of the time without any outside help um, suddenly can't do it. You know, and there's there's a lot of narrative around, you know, babies being too big or babies being too small or all these things that start to worry you when you're a pregnant person. So. Let's go back a bit and see why that might be. So there are lots of ancient paintings that have been found on the walls of caves all over the world, and they depict vertical birth positions. So women standing or sitting or squatting, but upright. And even um, there's pictures of Cleopatra, the queen of Egypt, maybe one of the most famous pharaohs ever, um, she's shown as standing as she's giving birth. So it wasn't just something that, you know, the poor people did. Cleopatra also was giving birth standing up. <laughs> and in the Middle Ages, so going forwards a bit, you would have a birthing chair. So if you're a rich family, you'd have a birthing chair that was beautifully painted and it would be passed down from generation to generation. If you weren't so rich, then there would be a community chair and whoever needed it, it would be passed to that person. And it was a chair where you could sit upright, a bit like a birthing stool where there'd be space for the baby to come down and out. So again, very upright. And one theory is that this changed 
because King Louis XIV in the 17th century uh, liked to see his wives and his mistresses give birth. And of course, it's not so easy to see what's going on if somebody is upright, because all the action sort of down below and it's hard to, to see in, unless you get into an awkward position. Um, so he asked that they lie down. And I, uh, this recently um, came out in a sort of TikTok post that went viral, but I've seen it in lots of places, you know, in, in research journals mentioned by sociologists and historians. And so I, I think we can take it as fact that he did enjoy, for some reason, I don't know whether he was interested in bodies or what it was that made him enjoy it, but he asked that the women would lie down. And because people want to, you know, be like royalty and um, be like the king and, you know, he was famous for his beautiful buildings and amazing clothing, you know, that people want to emulate that, they started to copy it. It's also at this time that um, in the 16th and 17th century that male physicians started to deal with births rather than midwives or the traditional birth assistants. And so there was very much um, this wanting to control the delivery. And of course, that's easier if a woman's lying on her back, because again, you can see what's going on. So it's the convenience of the caregiver to make it as easy as possible that they feel they can see everything that's going on and have a better chance of controlling it. But you'll see as I get later on onto the practical bits that lying down makes it a lot more difficult to give birth. Occasionally, somebody might choose to be in that position. They might be finding it comfortable. And the vast majority of women I know, when they're left to their own devices, choose a more upright position because it's much more comfortable. It, it cuts the intensity of the contractions considerably, more than half. Um, you can move around more, all sorts of things that we'll get to. So I think it's a combination of, of things that at the time that the male doctors started taking over um, delivery um, and men started to come into what had been previously a female only arena that things started to shift so I you know just take a moment to take that in you might be a bit shocked <laughs> that it wasn't because you know it was saving lots of lives it was because it made it easier for people to see what was going on and we will get to later on to talk about you know when intervention is necessary and you know i'm not against intervention at all it say it does save lives but what i am really passionate about is giving the body a chance at physiological birth at just working with your body's natural ability to give birth first and then stepping in if it's needed if it's really needed um, with the intervention so I think another aspect of this is how the body has become seen as a sophisticated machine. And in the early 1500s, it became common um, to do dissections because people were still learning about the, the body. And so they would cut into the body to understand which bits were connected to what, what's where. And when a body is no longer alive, I think it's easier to see the body as lots of parts. So for example, if you're looking at the muscles and the bones and trying to understand how a leg moves to walk, then you can see there's the bones, the muscles, the sinews, the ligaments, and it looks a bit like a collection of levers and ropes and pulleys. What we now know further along in time is that when a body is alive, there is something called fascia. It looks a bit like that filmy white stuff you get on a chicken breast that connects all of the muscles all the way through the body. So then they're not separate from each other, but they're actually connected in one whole system. But they couldn't find that when they were working on a dead body um, that you know wasn't full of vitality, wasn't you know, fluids moving around and all that kind of thing. It affects how you can see the body. So really that this 
process of dissection at the time it was starting meant that people looked at the body and broke it down into parts. And this became even more influential when the Industrial Revolution started um, because there were lots of machines around everyday people. <laughs> they could see machines all around and it kind of, you know, makes sense that you start thinking about, oh, I've got to eat. So it's like fuel for a, a, a machine to work. Um, you can see how it, how it happened. And this continues all the way through to the present day. Um, I mean, in the 1920s, apparently there was this public health message in America that directly talked about the body being like a car that needs a yearly tune-up, needs an MOT. And I, I myself say that sometimes to people. I'll say, you know, I really recommend you going to have a, um, a treatment with a chiropractor or an osteopath who specialises in pregnancy, because it's like an MOT for the body. I should stop saying that. <laughs> Because what I'm meaning is, you know, we can we can have input and help make sure there's alignment and um, there's not too much tightness and we can have a, a positive effect on, on the body. And it's very easy to make this analogy. We're so used to it having an MOT like a car, but actually that that just reinforces it. So I'm going to stop doing that from now on. In the 1960s, um, the National Geographic had an article about the human body, which was actually called the incredible machine. <laughs> so it's very explicit, you know, the body as machine. And of course, you know, we've, we've progressed. Um, scientists and researchers have learned much more about how the brain works, um, epigenetics, about genes, or, you know, we've learned so much more. But I still think that this idea is the of the body as a machine persists in the public imagination you know I just gave an example of how how I use that as well and in many medics minds it's an easy way to think about things so even though you know we know there's a mind-body connection we still sort of separate things out um, so I wonder you know ha have you ever been made to feel that like your your body is a machine that isn't working properly there's something wrong with the bit of it that needs fixing I, I can think of examples when that, that I've been made to feel like that. But I also know from all the yoga that I've done that the body is really intelligent. And when we tune in and we, we let it, um, it can guide us to help soothe our nervous system or to choose a, a position that's more comfortable during birth, birthing. So let's turn to birth specifically, you know, what, why is this important? So if we think of the, the body as a machine, what does this mean for labor and birth? So I want to give you an example. Have you heard of a partogram? Even if you've had a baby before, you might not have heard of it. But what you probably will have seen is that the midwife is very busy during the labor, writing lots of things down. And a partogram is a graphical record of key data. So things like the baby's heart rate, um, after a vaginal examination, how dilated you are, lots of information that they're charting to see that there's progress. For a long time, there's been this idea of a guide for dilation is one centimeter per hour. So I wonder if you've heard of that, one centimeter per hour. Where does this come from? That's very precise. And it has really affected how things play out when you're in the midwife led unit or in the delivery suite. So let's let's have a look at where this came from. So there was a doctor called Dr. Friedman in the 1950s, and he decided to create a study which followed 500 first time mums. And he plotted their rate of dilation per hour on a chart. So most people have heard dilation when they, you know, they, they know they're pregnant and they start reading. What happens first of all with the normally the cervix is a sort of barrel shape. And in the first stage of labor, it's all about the barrel thinning and then opening is the dilation. So that you've got space for the baby to come down and out. And you, you know, fully dilated is 10 centimeters. So just in case you need that bit of information. So he was measuring the rate of dilation per hour on a chart and it, the, um, the results that he got, he got is called the Friedman's curve. 
And that's what people refer to when they're, they're checking somebody's, an individual's rate of dilation compared to this study back in the 1950s. So he found that the rate of dilation varied within the total time of labor. And it was broken into sections. So he found that the length of time it took to dilate from zero to four centimeters was 8.6 hours. So to get to four centimeters took 8.6 hours on average. From four centimeters to 10 centimeters, the average dilation time was about five hours. So the, this next bit of the labor tends to go a little bit more quickly, things sped up. And so this is why it's considered now the active stage of labor. He also found that when dilation gets to nine centimeters, there's a slight slowing down until you get to 10 centimeters. And then pushing, once you've got the, the go, go ahead, yep, yeah, go ahead, you're fully dilated, push. <laughs> pushing took an average of one hour. So they're very specific. And you can see how this affects policies. So if you, if you already had a baby, um, generally you're only admitted once you've reached four centimeters, because then that's when you're considered to be an active labor. Um, some of you might have had the experience of wanting to get in the pool, but being told you have to be a certain number of centimeters dilated before you're allowed to get in the pool. With the pushing, he was, showed that it took an average of one hour to push before the baby was actually born. And you know, when, when you get onto that second stage of pushing, the midwife will be noting down you know, how long it's taking and they'll start to worry if it, it goes on a long time and they'll start talking about intervention and like four steps to help the baby come out. So what he stated has a real impact on the policies that we see in hospitals today. But, right, let's go back to the original study. 95% of those 500 mums were sedated at the beginning of labor. In the 1950s, it was very common that you would be sedated. You went into labor, go into hospital and immediate sedation. And 50% of those, so 250 women were induced. And in those days, we didn't have um, the balloon induction. I can talk a bit more about that later. So it was a pharmacological intervention. So he wasn't actually measuring physiological birth in most cases. There'd already been some intervention. So if we had 95% were sedated, 50% induced, you know, it's five, maybe 5% that had a purely physiological birth. But we're basing everybody now coming into hospital on that study. So the standard practice at the moment in the UK is that you have a vaginal examination every four hours. And there have been studies looking at that. And then what they found is that every two hours, if you do it every two hours, instead of the standard of four hours, there's actually an increase in the amount of synthetic oxytocin being used. So that's the you know, um, artificial hormone oxytocin being used to help the contractions become more effective. So if you start measuring more often, then it's more likely that you're going to need to use some synthetic hormones. Where they started doing this measuring, the partogram, tracking all the details in the latent phase, so between zero and four centimeters before they consider you to be an established labor, then they found that there's an increase in cesarean. So that, that was by a Cochrane review and Cochrane is like a really gold standard. They, they bring lots and lots of studies together, take the best evidence. So they came to the conclusion that maybe the partogram should only be used from six centimeters onwards because otherwise it's um, actually bringing more intervention into the birth that may not be needed actually. That's quite big. <laughs> I just want that to sink in for a moment. So a lot of what is happening at the moment is based on a study in the 1950s that now looking back, we would say is not really a great study. 
you know, so now that's why some people decide that they don't want to have vaginal examinations. I think often people think they're compulsory. But like anything, there is a choice about them. You might not get a good reception, <laughs> but there is a choice. Um, there is also evidence saying that having the first vaginal examination is useful. And that, I think that's particularly the case at the moment in the pandemic and in lockdown where, um, you know, usually the partner is having to wait outside until you're in established labor. And that, so that four centimeters becomes a gateway to whether you can go in and your partner can join you. So particularly at the moment, that first one I think might be useful, <laughs> but then after that, it doesn't actually tell us when the baby's going to be born. It doesn't actually tell us that because women's bodies respond, you know, in different ways. And, you know, I, th I think very often it, we can feel like our body is an object, a clever object um, that carries around and lets us lead our life. Um, but we forget actually how much the environment can affect us. So some people are very sensitive to the language that is used around them. So if a midwife, hopefully she wouldn't, but if a midwife said, oh, you're just three centimeters, you might feel really judged. That might have, you know, effect on you. You think, oh, I should be further along by now. My body's not coping, you know, it's not doing very well. <laughs> or perhaps, um, you know, you have a negative association with hospitals. And so going into a hospital, even though it's to a maternity department, the smells of a hospital, the bright clinical lights might make your body respond in a way that you sort of contract and you shut down a bit because you don't like it, you know, and that's going to have an effect on how the labour progresses because we don't, we're not made of separate parts, but, you know, our emotions, our nervous system, everything is connected. And so if we can make a woman as comfortable as possible and not worry so much about the numbers and whether she's reaching that one centimeter every hour, she can relax and let this clever, intelligent body get on with what it knows how to do. So, you know, if we see the body as a machine that follows this set pattern and that we're all the same and we should all be dilating one centimeter every hour, it's setting us up to fail. Um, we know it's not a linear relationship that if you've taken six hours to get to four centimetres, it's going to take another six hours to get to eight centimetres. It just doesn't work like that. I've had lots of birth stories where, um, you know, women have, say, reached six centimetres and it's taken, you know, quite some hours to do that. And then whoop, 20 minutes later, she's fully dilated, pushing, baby comes out quickly. There's, you know, there's so much more to our own experience, um, everything that we bring with us to the birth that's gonna make a difference. We're not just a standard cookie cutter machine that, that's gonna follow the same rules. So as I said, I'm not against the intervention at all, but it's about creating the right conditions that the body has the best chance of physiological birth as possible. So let's move on to some really practical things. Um, how can you give yourself the best chance of physiological birth? So during pregnancy, it's really important to remain active. And I know that's not been so easy during the pandemic because in lockdown, people have changed their movement patterns. So it might have been before that you would go um, to work and you'd have to commute and walk to the train, walk the other end, go up and down stairs, you know, or maybe you used to go to the gym and you can't do that. Or maybe you love swimming and the swimming is such a great exercise during pregnancy, but you can't do that right now. So a lot of people's movement levels have really dropped and there has been in, an increase in induction um, during lockdown. And I, I think a, a part of that is to do with less movement and a lot more sitting. We've become a lot more sedentary. So I really, really encourage you to move you know, and it, even a bit is really helpful than doing nothing at all. So, you know, even if it's a, a, a small walk every day outside to get some fresh air, that's going to help. 
Um, obviously, I'm biased. I think pregnancy yoga is really helpful because that helps you stretch and strengthen, know how to move safely during pregnancy. And it also helps you practice positions that you might actually use during the labor itself. But yeah, and any kind of movements that you can do regularly um, will really help because when we're moving around, that helps our baby to move into a comfortable position. So connected to that is posture. So first the movement, second is the posture. And if we've been sitting up, you know, working from home, often not on a good chair, might be your dining room chair rather than a, an office chair that's designed for sitting in a, in a good way. Um, then what we can find ourselves doing is, is sort of slumping back. And what we want to try and choose in pregnancy, particularly the third trimester, the whole third trimester, is to sit nice and upright or leaning forwards. So if I show you with my model pelvis. So these are our sitting bones. And so although we talk about the pelvic bowl, actually it's not a sort of bowl like this, keeping all the, I always imagine a cake mixture and the cake mixture you don't want to swap out, but actually our pelvis is like this. So it's a bowl that's tipped forwards. And so if I'm sitting upright, I'm sitting on my sitting bones and the spine comes up here. Or if I'm leaning forwards, it's even more exaggerated. If I'm slumping back, then I create a shape with the spine that's a nice sort of hammock rounded shape. And that means it's much more likely that your baby will get really comfortable in a back to back position. Baby's back against your spine. And if you've had a baby before, you might have heard of posterior babies, back to back babies. And the labors tend to be longer and more intense. And part of the reason for that is that this lumbar spine, um, if you're in a back-to-back -back position, it's harder for the baby's head to navigate over that promontory there. Whereas if you're sort of choosing more forward leaning positions, it's easier for the baby to come into the hammock of your bump and have space around that. So if you're sort of aware of your posture during pregnancy, it can help your baby to get comfortable in an ideal position ready to start birth. Um, and you might have seen babies uh, who always want to have their head to one side. Um, so I, in my mother and baby yoga classes, I'll see sometimes mums sort of try to centre the baby's head and they'll go straight back there. After about two months, that stops happening and they start moving the head a lot more freely. And I think that often happens when the baby's been stuck in a certain position in the womb at the end of pregnancy. And they've just got really used to the muscles being longer on one side, contracted on the other side. And when they're in that kind of position, it makes it harder to come through the pelvis because there's a bigger surface area to move through, through the pelvic inlet, through the pelvic outlet. What we want babies to do is to have the chin tucked in. And then this is the smallest surface area that we can have coming down through the birth canal. Whereas if they're heads to the side or they've got a hand, we're looking where they're going, a lot more surface area. So if we keep on moving, every time mum moves, the baby has a chance to move as well. And they know reflexively, instinctively, where they want to be if given a chance. So even if in labor, you discover that the baby is back to back, it's not a reason to panic because the baby can change at any time. Um, maybe I'll come back to that in a bit of sort of some things that you could, you could do. So as I said, you know, general rule is in the third trimester, try and choose positions where you're sitting nice and upright on the sofa, stuff a load of cushions behind you so you're not slumping back um, or leaning forwards. So if you have a birth ball, Swiss ball, exercise ball, whatever you want to call it, you could sit on the floor and then lean forwards onto the ball. Or you can sit on a dining room chair backwards and lean onto the back of the chair. So you've got this leaning forwards and that will help the baby's back come into the curve of your bump instead, which is a much easier for them to start um, laboring. Um, 
So let me just talk for a minute about the, the back to back. Um, so, you know, something easy that you could do is come onto hands and knees. So you're coming all the way over like this, knees are underneath the hips, you've got your hands underneath your shoulders, and then the baby is able to move into a different space, baby's back away from your back, and it's much easier to come past the, the lower spine there. Um, something else that can really help is a rebozo. So you don't need a special cloth. Um, any kind of cotton scarf can help. And I'd really, I'd really recommend putting a scarf into your hospital bag because it can be used for so many different things. Let me just stand up to show you. So one way that you can use a rebozo to help the baby's position is that say I am on hands and knees, or maybe I'm leaning onto a sofa or a bed or a birth ball. You can bring the scarf around your bump. So you make sure it's only got the bump top and bottom, and then you need somebody else and they would hold the scarf. So I, I'd be leaning forwards and they need to hold the scarf really firmly so that they're carrying some of the weight of the baby. And then they can do a sifting motion, taking the hands backwards and forwards, even better in a slightly sort of circular movement. And this helps to um, let the muscles relax around the abdomen, um, let the fascia that I was talking about before move really freely. And this creates a different kind of space for the baby so that the baby can move into a better position and you know, just swing around. And I've, I've been given, you know, sent birth stories where exactly this has happened. So in the, um, the workshop that I do, the masterclass, I talk you through exactly how to do that with your birth partner. Um, or I also run an online birth preparation course, um, which has videos showing you exactly how to do all those things in much more detail. Something else I wanted to talk about, you know, while you're still pregnant that you could do is to focus on the pelvic floor. So if you have had a cesarean in the past, I know some people who were signing up to this are planning a VBAC, a vaginal birth after cesarean, you'll know, you know, the pelvic floor is, is important whether a birth is vaginal or not, because, um, you know, with a cesarean, you've had the anesthetic, you've had a catheter. And I think if your pelvic floor is really nice and healthy and you're used to doing the exercises, it's much quicker to, to get that connection again and respond to the need to have a wee or whatever. Um, the other reason it's really important to practice pelvic floor exercises is that the pelvic floor plays a part in helping the baby's position and starting the labour get going because you want the baby's head to be rubbing against the cervix. The weight of the head um, helps get the prostaglandins going, which kickstarts the other birth hormones. Um, so we want a pelvic floor that can move. Um, a lot of people worry about their pelvic floor not being strong enough, um, but actually in the pelvic floor tends to get stronger because it's helping carry the weight of the baby above. Um, so we don't want a pelvic that's too tight. We don't want a pelvic floor that's too soft. <laughs> we want one that can move and respond. Um, and in more cases, I actually find there are women that have too tight a pelvic floor than um, too loose. <laughs> so when I teach the pelvic floor exercises, we're not focusing on squeezing as hard as you possibly can. We're squeezing a little bit to make that connection from the brain to those muscles, just a little gentle squeeze and focusing on relaxing as much as we can. So it's good to practice these regularly because I think if you practice them during pregnancy, you're more likely to practice them once the baby arrives. Every time you feed the baby, you can do a few pelvic floor exercises and that will really help support your body now that you're carrying the baby on the outside. Help supports the back, it's all connected. <laughs> so we had moving is important, posture is important, pelvic floor exercises are important. And the fourth thing I wanted to mention uh, was seeing a chiropractor or an osteopath. Um, who specializes in pregnancy. Um, so as I was saying at the beginning, just to check that everything is as aligned as possible, um, because 
the ligaments and the, the muscles inside of the mum help guide the baby. And if something's too tight, it creates less space for the baby to move into the best position possible. So sometimes it might just be a one-off, um, you know, and they see yeah, everything's aligned. If there's an issue, um, then it might require a few more appointments. But if you have the resources, then I, I think that's a really good investment. Personally, I would put the money into something like that and choose a secondhand buggy and pram. Um, because your, your birth experience will stay with you your whole life. You know, sometimes you can try and push it to one side if it's not been a great experience, but it does come with you. So I think anything that you can do to, to prepare yourself is, is really worth it. Let's look at some examples during the actual birth. So if we go back to the back to back baby, baby in that posterior position, baby's spine against your spine. What sometimes will happen is that the, the uterus will, your womb will try to turn the baby into a better position. And this can look like nudgy little pushes. So if you've already had a baby and you felt contractions, they're not like a normal contraction. They're sort of little nudgy half contractions because the, the uterus isn't trying to push the baby down and out. It's actually trying to shift the baby's position. And I think this is easier to understand when you when you understand how the, mus the muscular organ of the uterus is what it consists of. There are three types of muscle. Long muscles that run down. And they work in the first stage of labour to contract and draw the cervix out of the way. So it's a bit like putting on a roll neck jumper over your head and you're pulling so the head pops through. <laughs> Um, but it's happening from the bottom up, pulling the cervix out of the way. There are also round muscles that are more active in the second stage, pushing the baby down and out. So it's like a tube of toothpaste, squeeze, 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 squeeze all the way down. And then there are a third set of muscles, which are the spiral muscles. And that's what helps the baby to turn, to come through the pelvis, because the pelvic inlet is wider from side to side, but the pelvic outlet is wider from front to back because this moves a lot more than in my, my model. <laughs> so the baby has to turn to come through. And so when those nudgy pushes happen, the, the uterus is trying to change the baby into another position rather than pushing down and out. But a midwife who doesn't know about this, so maybe more likely on the delivery suite where there tends to be more intervention more quickly, might say, stop pushing, you're not fully dilated yet. You risk pushing the baby's head against your cervix and getting a swollen cervix, which is then gonna cause problems because it won't fully dilate. And if you are told to stop pushing, when you have this, that's what your body wants to do. It can be incredibly tiring. You're fighting your body. And you, know, you might get so tired that that leads then to an epidural. And then you can see the cascade of intervention starting. So by stopping your body, rather than trusting that it knows what it's trying to do, you're working against physiological birth. You're not giving the body a chance. So, you know, a good way to look at it might be, well, let's go with this for 10 minutes and see what happens. Make sure you're in a, a nice active position more upright or leaning forward so the baby's got space to move with those nudgy pushes and then reevaluate. So it's not all or nothing here, but just giving a chance. Because we're all different and, you know, there are different contraction patterns um, that help you know where the baby is um, on the journey, what might be happening. Um, we know that women labor in different ways because they have different bodies. I had somebody um, last year who's now in mother and baby yoga and her contraction never got closer than 20 centimeters, 20 minutes apart, 20 minutes apart. That is not what you tend to find in the pregnancy books or in the textbooks, but her baby came beautifully. Um, it's just how her body was working. She made the most of each contraction when it did come. 
a slowing of contractions might mean that your body is being really intelligent and having a rest before the next stage. It doesn't mean if your contractions are fading that your body's giving up. What, what can classically happen between the first stage where you're opening, dilation's happening, and the second stage where the baby's being pushed down and out, it's called transition. I don't know if you've heard of that term. But you're transitioning from the uterus doing one thing, one job, to another kind of job. And if you don't know about it, it can, even if you don't know what that's how it can feel like something weird's going on and people start to say logical things, you know, like, I've had enough, get my coat, I'm going home, I'm not doing this anymore. <laughs> um, or why do we want a baby anyway? But I've, one of my friends was saying that last year in her transition. So if we, you know, if we know that kind of thing is going to happen, um, then we're more likely to relax into it and you can have a rest and be thankful stage. So sometimes that's what happens in transition is that the body slows down, relaxes a bit, the contractions fade away a little bit, <sighs> you're having a breather. And then when they come back, something different is happening. Yeah, that sounds really nice, doesn't it? To, to be working with the body in a really intelligent way rather than fighting against it. And you know, the midwife will be giving you lots of positive reassurance. Oh, this is transition. This is a really good sign that you're going into the next stage. You're doing really well. Um, so you can see transition as a really good um, sign that things are, are carrying on. <laughs> um, another thing is Braxton Hicks. Some people have them in the lead up to birth. Some people don't. I didn't have any with either of my daughters. Whereas I've had people in my classes that have had such strong um, Braxton Hicks that they've been like contractions and they've had to lean against the wall using all the techniques that I teach to breathe through them. They've been that strong. And generally what happens when you have lots of practice contractions, the Braxton Hicks, is that you, you have a faster labor because your, your uterus has been in the gym, <laughs> toning and training. So it just goes to show the variation between women. And rather than expecting one centimeter per hour, everybody's the same, to let things unfold. And um, midwives, you know, traditionally would sit to one side and knit or crochet. So they're watching at the corner of their eye, just keeping an eye that everything's okay, but you don't feel watched. And they're just knitting away, letting things get on. And not interfering. And people who've experienced home birth, that's, that tends to be more how it looks. So let's use another example, water's breaking. So this can happen at any time during labor. Sometimes I hear people say, oh, you know, they, they think the waters will break right at the beginning. Um, but no, you know, there are all sorts of different signs for going into labor it might be that you've got a bit of backache or you're having some Braxton Hicks and you don't realize actually they're they're real contractions um maybe you are sick body's clearing itself out maybe your mucus plug goes but they don't have to happen in any particular order um and sometimes the the waters don't break at all the baby is born inside the amniotic sac with the membranes intact and that's called being born on call C-A-U-L. And uh, my husband's Italian and I was asking him and he said it's called nato con la camicia, nato con la camicia, which means born in your shirt, <laughs> which I thought was really, really sweet. Um, and it's meant to be incredibly rare, like one in 80,000 babies being born with their membranes intact. But then I had this really interesting experience last week where I'm in this um, hypnobirthing group and um, the lady who facilitates it, Sarah, had asked people, you know, and was talking about how amazing it sounds. And seven mums commented below. And four of them had had a baby that were born with their amniotic sac intact. And I know some of them had two children. Um, so I don't know how many had one, how many had two. But I thought, listen, even if we say that each of them has had two children, so that would be 14 children, four of them were born in their amniotic sac. Four out of 14 is more than a one in four chance. That's very different to one in 80,000. 
So I, I, that makes me think, and I, and I was thinking, well, I guess with hypnobirthing, there's more chance of a more gentle birth, maybe. But I also thought that part of the reason is that sometimes the waters are broken on purpose. So that baby would never have chance to, to go all the way through to being born with the, the membranes intact. So breaking the waters, so clinically speaking, is called artificial rupture of membranes, ARM for short. So, you know, sometimes um, you might be offered a sweep, perhaps you're beginning to go overdue and you're offered a sweep, which is where the midwife puts some fingers round between the cervix um, and the membranes to try and get all the prostaglandins going. And occasionally um, the waters break as a result of that. So that's a risk that if you have a sweep, that might happen. And then that can be a problem because the clock starts ticking. That, you know, the risk of infection doubles after 24 hours. So, you know, gone a day and then, you know, start looking at your watch or we need to intervene a bit more. So with any intervention, you always need to think about what are the benefits? What are the risks? You know, there might be situations where it would help to break the waters, but are there other things we can try first? And I think sometimes people think, well, sweep's not a real intervention because there aren't any drugs involved, but it is still something coming in and changing what would be happening naturally. And I've even heard occasionally somebody doing a sweep and then the midwife saying afterwards, oh, I broke your waters while I was in there. And that should never happen because you need consent. It is an intervention. So knowing ahead of time about things like that, you can say, you know, I do not want my waters to be broken. I don't want to risk it by having a sweep. Or you might decide that's OK, but it's, it's having enough information that you can make those decisions and know what your choices are. So can you see how you can have a cascade of intervention starting from something that sounds quite mild and benign? You know, most of the time, waters are going to break anyway, so why not get in and, and help hurry things along? You can see how easily that happens. Oh, let's take a little breather. So just let that sink in. You know, maybe it brings up feelings. Maybe if you've already had a baby and you were in that situation and you didn't know what you were getting into or you know, your full consent wasn't actually sought. You didn't know all the information. So you might need to just take a breather and be kind. You know, you don't know what you don't know. Okay, I'm going to give one more example. So lying on your back, this is where we started about you know, we used to see these upright positions in cave paintings, um, you know, hieroglyphics with Cleopatra, and then suddenly something changed. Women started lying on their back. And this is the image that we tend to see on TV all the time in sitcoms, lying in a hospital bed or even with feet up in stirrups. It's called the lithotomy position, which is a very vulnerable position. You know, it's like what you do when you go for a smear test. And I don't know anybody who actually enjoys smear tests. So there might be times when you need to lie on your back. Um, if you are going to have forceps or von twos, they do need to be able to see what they're doing and, you know, but um, when, when that thing came out on TikTok about King Louis XIV, um, a, a midwife from Brighton responded in an article and she was saying that the only time that she ever sees a mum reclined on a bed is when they're in hospital, never when they're at home because it's just not comfortable. <laughs> it makes the contraction so much more manageable if you're in an upright forward leaning position. And she said, you know, if you put a person in a room that has a flat bed, then they will climb onto the bed because it's so ingrained in us, what we've seen on TV. It's just like, oh, that's what I meant to do. It's like an invitation, right? Get on the bed. So what I want is to suggest, you know, we give the body a chance you can't, by the way, you can lie down, but lie on your left side, that would be ideal. So if you need to rest, you're getting tired, you can lie down on your left side and that will help the baby, instead of being back to back, sort of swing into your, your side, into a much more um, ideal position for the baby's head to move down into the pelvis. 
And there's another midwife um, who used to work in London and she had a massive um, amount of women having babies at home. So the percent, I think it's, is it 3% in the UK is, is standard for home births? And she had a 43% rate for home births because um, in her practice, it was all about consistency of care. So you'd have the same midwife and you know, she would come and see you in your house. Even if you were planning to give birth in hospital, she would come and see you where you were comfortable, you know, just what was familiar and where you could relax and have a good conversation. So a very different model than where we're sort of seeing a different midwife each time. And she found that when women are left to their own devices, they choose this kneeling, leaning forwards position. So you might have cushions on the floor, um, you're leaning onto your sofa, onto your bed, whatever's the right height. Um, the midwife led unit, you know, they often have a birth ball, you could be leaning onto that, leaning onto the side of the birth pool. So there's lots of um, scenarios where you could use this. Because, I, I, you know, this year I can remember a few birth stories where people said they felt comfortable leaning forwards onto their basin in the bathroom or onto the kitchen counter. And just by that act of leaning forwards, it cuts the intensity of the contractions in half. So much more manageable just by leaning forwards. Um, and I mentioned the lithotomy position. So we're very used to seeing on TV women having their knees taken apart, feet taken away. And you look, in one way, you kind of think, well, that makes space to, for the baby to come out. But the baby only needs this much space, the 10 centimetres. And what actually happens when you take the knees wide is that the thigh bones, the femurs, push, they push, um, put pressure on both sides and squeeze the front here. So they actually close the pelvic outlet. I remember the first time I saw a video about this and I had to pause it and just go, what? <laughs> so just let that sink in for a moment. When we take the thigh bones wide, knees out, it's, can you see how it's like a, going back to the lever example, it's lever, it's pushing in to the hip socket. And if you, that's happening on both sides, this joint that with the relaxing hormone gets nice and supple and, and gives some movement. Unfortunately, my model doesn't move, but it moves in real life when you've got lots of relaxing in your system. If you take the knees wide, it closes so it's a putting more pressure on your perineum. You're more likely to tear and need stitches afterwards. So instead, what I'd suggest is that you're on hands and knees. So your knees are directly underneath your hips. There's still plenty of room for a baby to come out. And, you know, if, if they're wanting to monitor, you know, see what's going on and they want you to be on the hospital bed because you've, you've, um, you're in delivery suite for some reason, rather than lying on your back, you can say, I feel much more comfortable being on hands and knees because I can move around. And it's not that you have to support yourself all the time on your hands, you know, which might get tiring after a while, because the beds change position. You can lean onto the back of the bed, so you're just supported, resting down. Um, but it means that you're able to move, um, and you're creating as much space through the pelvic outlet as possible. Because if you lie on your back, your weight the baby and the weight of your hips and this whole area, which is quite solid, stops the sacrum from moving. And there's something called notation and counter notation. So that the relaxing again softens these joints and this whole sacral area can move back out the way. Amazing. <laughs> this whole bit here can move back. And I've seen it in photos where you can see the bulge of the sacrum between the buttocks. It does, it moves back. But if you're lying on your back, it can't. So you can't make the same amount of space and you, your tailbone is sort of stuck. And the baby has to come against gravity, coming upwards, rather than if you're on hands and knees. And there's, because your tailbone moves more than this in real life. You can move, you know, make an extra centimeter, two centimeters space. It's simple biomechanics. It's really simple anatomy, but because hospital systems, hospital policies 
have taken over it you know and people get used to working in a certain way then we forget or we ignore this kind of very simple information that can be birth changing home birth midwives you know tend to be really interested in all this kind of thing and they get you to move around your environment how you're comfortable a lot of midwife led units also that's why they like working there. They like facilitating women to, to work with their bodies. Um, at my local hospital, I know at least two of the midwives have done the spinning babies training. So they, they're really interested in trying to, to help this process. So I'm not being negative about all health professionals. A lot of them are seeking information and they want to support women, be very women-centered. But I don't want you to be the person that gets the person who doesn't know about this and their birth changes course because they don't know about it. So sometimes, um, you know, I hear somebody say, oh, well, I had all these intentions of being in these active positions, but then I ended up needing to be induced and they put the monitor on in a way that I could just lie down in bed. So that's why it's really important that your birth partner also knows about this kind of thing. And at the time they're saying, oh, we're gonna monitor you, says, hang on a minute, have you got one of those monitors that doesn't use the wires it's called an ambulant monitor you can walk around or if they don't I think as far as I understand there's only two at my local hospital so if, they, if you have to have the wires can you set it up in a way where you can be on hands and knees or that you've got a bit more ability to move around and sometimes you might say okay you've monitored for a while I want to take them off it's stopping me being comfortable and they might not like it <laughs> But that's where you need somebody who can be your advocates because you don't want to get into an argument um, when, when you're trying to focus on your body. So that's why you need somebody else there who can say, yeah, but when we were at home, she was moving around, she was so much more comfortable, we want to still use that kind of thing. And that's why I do the masterclasses is so that you understand this physical component of labour. So, you know, this is a really sort of relevant thing. I, I, as I say, I volunteer at the hospital and I've been working with one of the midwives on a series of posters. So we've done a poster around perineal massage, done a poster from like the ultrasound waiting room on colostrum harvesting. And then she wanted to do one around, um, well, for people who are in the induction ward and they're waiting around, you know, maybe they've had a pessary or a drip and they're waiting for something to happen. So they've got time to read what's on the wall. And I said, okay, we could do this, this and this, and I want to put upright positions. She's like, oh, no, no, because there's more risk of um, damage to the perineum. Um, so we're having a discussion about it because um, there, there was a study a few years ago where they found that a compress can really help. Just lightly holding a compress to the perineal tissues. The perineum is the, the part underneath you um, and it was found that if you just give some gentle support that you can reduce the risk of tearing. But often that's needed in a position where there's a lot of pressure against the perineum. A lot of pressure because you're lying on your back, knees are out wide, squeezing this together rather than giving space. And so that compress is needed to support under a pressurized situation. If you're in another kind of position where the pressure is taken away, you don't need that intervention. So you don't need to be in a place where the midwife can easily see where to be holding something. So it's a bit like the chicken and the egg. It's great to use the, the compression, um, you know, when, when it's unavoidable. Do you see how things connect together? So for me, I'm really passionate about supporting pregnant women and their birth partners to be informed so they know the right questions to ask or when to speak up and pipe up and say, hang on a minute, but if we do this, won't that have that consequence? Because I want you to know that you have choices. I want you to feel empowered to trust your instincts. I want your birth partner to feel empowered that when you're having strong contractions, that are helping you meet your baby sooner rather than later. And, you know, maybe things 
are not going as, as quickly as the midwife wants, that your birth partner can go, hang on a minute, let's try a different active birth position. Because you're focused on where you are and you're comfortable where you are and it's a good active birth position. But sometimes you need somebody else to go, let's just try something different rather than immediately going to intervention. So there are different ways um, that you can learn more. <laughs> um, you can join a pregnancy yoga class. Uh, they're online at the moment, so it's very easy to join from wherever you are. And the beauty about pregnancy yoga is that week after week, you're practicing things. So they feel really normal and um, you, you know what feels comfortable, what your preferences are. It becomes second nature to get into positions that we wouldn't do in ordinary life. <laughs> so that's one thing, you can join me in pregnancy yoga. Um, another thing is that you can join the masterclass. So that's two, a two hour session where you can ask questions and I take you through from pregnancy, through early labor, all the way through about how different positions can support which part and particular scenarios, like if you have an epidural, there's, there's lots you can do to really support your body to try and avoid further intervention. Um, and I also wrote a book. Let me grab it. So this came out last September in 2020, Pearls of Birth Wisdom. And she's pregnant on the front and then has her baby holding her baby on the back. <laughs> and it's a collection of more than 20 stories, um, different kind of stories. There's VBAC, Breach, Induced, you know, I tried to cover lots of different angles um, and I find it really helps to read people's stories because it's in the little details that you think, oh, I never thought about that before, how that's kind of important. Um, and then I've also put all my sort of insights from teaching pregnancy yoga over the last 15 years, lots of practical tips. And at the end of each chapter, there's questions to reflect on your experience of different things um, and further resources if there's a particular area you want to explore more. So you can get it through Amazon, or if you're in the UK, you can order it directly from me and I can write a little message in if you like. So there are three ways, you can come to pregnancy yoga, you can come to the masterclass, or you can use the book, which comes with a link to a relaxation that I really recommend. So I hope this has been very useful and has raised questions about how we see the body. What I would like to leave you with is the more we practice checking in with our body and what we need, the easier that will be during the birthing journey. So, you know, once, twice a day, just taking a moment. Let's do that now, just to finish. Just let all the information sink in. So if you feel okay to close your eyes, taking your awareness in. And just doing a little scan down through the body, all the way down through the shoulders, the arms, try and include every part and just notice how does your body feel? Have you been sitting too long in one position? Have you been sitting on your foot and it's gone numb? Do you really need a wee? Are you thirsty? So just see what information your body has for you. How's your breathing? Is it all up in your chest? Are you, you know, in the third trimester and your baby's taking a lot of space and it's, it's hard to catch your breath? And just see if you can soften into your body a little bit. Can you find a little bit of kindness? Just changing position slightly might make all the difference. Just seeing if you can let your breath deepen a bit. And so once you've had a chance to feel how your body is, you might find that there's a need there. 
maybe you realize you're more tired than you thought and you need a nap <laughs> later on. Okay, and then opening your eyes. So when, when you do this checking in and this listening to your body, as I said, it, it becomes easier to do it than in labor. And so when you're in the birthing journey, you can be listening and actually it feels so much better if I have that leg in front or I'm in that position or in between the contractions. Oh, I haven't drunk for ages. I'm really thirsty because contractions are much more painful if, if you're not hydrated rather than being focused on something outside of you, like a contraction app that takes your mind out. So it can feel quite tempting to try and distract yourself and go away from the body. <gasps> oh, is it gonna to be too much sensation and overwhelming? But actually, the more that we can try and listen in, we can find the answers to how to help ourselves through the, the birth journey. So if you want to do more of that kind of practicing and all the, you know, really practical, knowing what positions, stay in touch, email me if you've got any questions. Um, and good luck. You know, I wish you all the best for your birthing journey. And if this has been helpful in some way, please let me know that as well. <laughs> all right. Take good care. Bye.